Hello, and welcome to the Armin Show podcast. Science, people, creativity, learning more. The show continues to grow. YouTube, Spotify, subscribe if you haven't. Leave a review as we develop the platform. Over 380 episodes at this time. On this one here, we have the wonderful author of this book, Attention Span, a very important topic in 2023. The author is Gloria Mark. Professor Gloria Mark from UC Irvine joins us on the show. Gloria, glad to have you on here. Thank you for having me. I'm very glad to have you on. Very important material and in a category that I think is way more relevant today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or so on. Now, for some backstory, you are professor in the Department of Informatics at University of California, Irvine. We've had past guest Nicole Ituriaga from there, which is wonderful. Author of the book, Attention Span, over 200 scientific research articles and noted for research on social computing and the social impacts of digital media. Now, this is a very relevant category. What caused you to go into this category in the first place or someone who would want to go or curious how you got into it? Well, uh, I got into it through per my own personal experience. So I've, I've been working in the field of what's called human computer interaction uh, for some time. And that's studying how people interact with technology. It's the relationship people have on their devices, with their devices. Um, and it, it's a mutual influence. Devices affect our behavior. We in turn shape the way that devices are used and, and ultimately the way uh, technology is designed. So I had been working in this area and then I also noticed that I was having trouble myself with focusing. And uh, at the same time, I was having trouble uh, staying away from the screen. I found myself just glued to the screen and I found my attention shifting back and forth between screens. And I just began to wonder, is this normal? Is it just me? And you know, as a psychologist, someone who can study human behavior, I decided I would study this and see to what extent it's widespread. Uh, and it turns out it's not just me. It's not just you. It happens to be, I would guess in the billions at this time. I'm not sure the number of individuals on devices, but it's very substantial. Many important topics are brought up as far as attention, task switching, uh, self-control, uh, your executive functioning in the book. Now, if an average person is looking at their phone right now and making use of it, and it is a bit on autopilot, let's say, what would be some of the elements in place that would be taking in uh, making use of their mind? How are they possibly in a encapsulated state as far as their attention? What is working on them? Well, um, you know, people have we have different uh, networks in our attentional system. So there is a system which involves um, being vigilant, you know, sticking to to a task, keeping your attention on something. Uh, there's another attentional system that's about orienting, which means choosing what to focus on. So if you have a notification that comes across your screen, um, you might choose to focus on that. And, and chances are, um, we, we very often do automatically respond to, you know, blinking, flashing things. Uh, and then there's a, a third network that's called executive control. And this is about um, re regulating, make, making sure that we filter out irrelevant information so that we can really, you know, free up our resources to be able to uh, focus on the task at hand. An important part that I noticed while I was reading that I took into account is the differentiation between, I would call it your proactive sense versus reactive, uh, your control of what is happening versus the resource taking control of yourself. What goes on in the mind that helps you keep control of your attention such that it's not thwarted? 
Yeah, it's it's such a great question because you know, very often we might feel like we're just in a ping pong, uh, sorry, a pinball machine where we're just being knocked around from, you know, one, one thing to another and we've just lost control. And, and sometimes we, we can feel that way when we're trying to keep up with email and then we have thoughts in our minds that make us want to look up something on the web or go to social media or check news. And then we know we have work to do and we go back to that. So uh, sometimes we, we can be in a reactive mode where we're just reacting to information that's, that's coming in like email or notifications that come in. But we can also be reactive to things with, within us like urges. So we might have an urge to check information. So uh, that's very different than being proactive, which is being in control and making sure that you can make the choices of whether you want to stay focused or whether you want to intentionally go and, and check news, say, or check your email. So it's, it's really about um, making your actions intentional as opposed to just simply reacting to the demands of your digital environment. Being more deliberate and intentional in what we do, mm -hmm. what we choose to do. I like the idea of when we are to check something, if we set up that, okay, this is what we'll be doing, or as you mentioned in the book, we'll put a time limit on something such that we still set it up beforehand. The more we are doing beforehand, it's us managing the scenario. And even if we set up an item to alarm us later on, it was us who set that up beforehand it was within our control what are things that cause us from the outside to be more um, falling into autopilot what kinds of triggers throw us back into that autopilot framework yeah so we have a type of attention it's called exogenous attention and that's when we react to things that are outside of us that we can't help but react to and so, you know, when you hear a loud noise like fireworks, you can't help but react to it, right? You, you have to listen to it um, as opposed to, you know, let's say there might be music playing in the background. You, you might go in and out of listening to that music. Um, if we see a sudden flash on our screen, a notification, we can't help but react to it, right? You can make a choice. Do you want to click on it or not? But but we have this automatic reaction. And so for a lot of people, it's become habitual. So for example, um, many people when they see their phones, they have an, an habitual reaction to just grab the phone, right? That's automatic, right? It's not intentional. It's not even something in our conscious awareness. And so a lot of what we do when we use our digital devices um, it, these are automatic kinds of actions. Uh, we don't necessarily think about it. We've done them so often. We, we react to stimuli, noises, you know, flashing lights, and we just can't help ourselves. When we focus on items and we use our attention for things that are not for us, for example, if we do that repeatedly, what kinds of cognitive resources are we using? What does that look like? So people have a limited amount of cognitive resources. And basically, you know, things you do throughout the day can drain your resources. We can also do things that replenish our resources. So you know, in my book, I use this metaphor of a tank, that we have a tank of resources. Um, if you get a really good night's sleep, um, or let's say you come back from vacation and you're really refreshed, you're starting your day with a full tank of resources. But then we do things throughout the day, um, shifting your attention very rapidly can drain your resources. 
Um, also, uh, just having long periods of sustained focus can drain your resources, thinking hard, being challenged uh, to do things. And so, um, you know, our, our resources tend to drain. There, there's also, uh, what also affects our resources to drain is simply the time since when we woke up. So simply time over the course of the day, we, we, our minds get tired. Um, and that's, that's going to lead to fewer resources toward the end of the day. So, you know, imagine yourself having this, this limited tank and things we do can replenish the tank, things we do can drain the tank. We perform best when we have, you know, a really full set of resources. When our resources are, you know, pretty spent, then we perform very poorly. We, you know, it's hard to stay focused. It's hard to read anything. It's hard to generate new ideas. We, we tend to just, you, we've all had that experience where we're kind of reading the same thing over and over and it's not really, we're not comprehending it, right? We're, we're just, we're spent. Actually, the thing you just mentioned, the over and over, is it the case that when we are low on resources, we might replay audio that we heard earlier 20 times, we're more likely to just replay a song in our head or have the same thought over and over things are just replaying? Uh, I don't know that that's connected to having low resources. Um, there's, uh, I know that there is some research done on this idea of rumination where people just keep replaying things in their heads. I, I think it's, it's due to other things as well. I know that if a person scores high on a personality trait, which is called neuroticism, they, they tend to have that kind of behavior where you're just, you know, you, you have, let's say, a discussion with your colleague and it didn't go so well. So you keep replaying that over and over in your mind and you keep thinking, oh, could I have said something different or did I react? Okay, this is, this is a characteristic of someone who's high in neuroticism. Long live the big five and its informative nature on each of the segments. I look at it a lot because I'm always analyzing my qualities and how they relate um, with others. Uh, in neuroticism, I am low, but in some uh, agreeableness, I'm high, for example. Mm. It's good to know more about our own our own being. Have you, uh, have you used that a lot for yourself to understand the world more smoothly in that same way? Or do you use it more just in for like research purposes? Well, both. Um, so, you know, personality, uh, it, it doesn't change a whole lot. It's, you know, basically pretty stable. Um, having said that, um, personality can change according to context. So, you know, I might be an extrovert if I'm with my friends. I might be an introvert if I'm with strangers who, you know, let's say I'm um, meeting with a, a group of lawyers and I don't know anyone, I might be very introverted. So, you know, to some extent, I've, I've used Big Five to, to understand myself. I, I think it's helpful. Um, but, you know, we, we use it a lot in our research and correlate it with uh, various kinds of digital behaviors. And one thing as far as similarities, uh, you had done word puzzles and anagrams quite a bit. And I used to a long time ago do a lot of word searches when I was little, uh, finding things diagonally and whatnot, which would be in the more regular kind of thinking, rote thinking versus the focused deep kind. Can you speak a bit on the difference between uh, deep thought thinking or big mind thinking and then uh, little mind thinking or the rote material thinking? Sure. So, you know, most people, when they think of focus, they think that there's two states. You're, you're focused or you're unfocused. And, you know, in studying this for a while, I realized that if you're engaged with something, it really makes a difference if you're really challenged or you're engaged and you're not at all challenged. So if I'm writing, I have to be challenged, right? Because I, I have to give it a lot of thought. 
And that's very different than when I play my, my anagram game, which is just a, um, it's a very simple game. Uh, doesn't require much mental effort. Uh, keeps me engaged. It's calming. Uh, it actually makes me happy when I play it. So th those are differences. So we set out to uh, study people's attention and we gave people probes. This was in a workplace. We had people of various job roles, uh, diff different uh, ages, um, males and females. And throughout the day, we would give them these probes, like very short questionnaires that ask them two questions. Uh, how, how engaged are you in the thing you're doing right now? And how challenged are you in the thing you're doing right now? And we also logged people's computer activity so we could see exactly what people were, were doing at the time that these probes came, at the time people answered them. And so we um, came up with a framework that if you're very engaged and challenged, we called it a state of focus. If you're engaged and not at all challenged, we call that rote attention. Uh, and if you're not engaged and not challenged, we call that bored. And if you're challenged and not at all engaged, we call that a state of frustration. Uh, an example of frustration is when I have a tech problem. I, I get very frustrated. I'm not engaged. I cannot bring myself to um, spend the time to figure it out, but I have to, right? Or else I can't do my work. So that becomes very frustrating. So we, we have this framework of these four kinds of attention. And what we found is that uh, focused attention works in rhythms throughout the day. So people have times when they're at their peak, uh, which is usually mid, mid to late morning, and then times when they're not. Uh, they're also at a peak in the afternoon, mid to late afternoon, 2, two to 3 p.m. And it corresponds to the, the ebb and flow of people's attentional resources that they have available. Sometimes we have a lot of resources, and then sometimes we're, we're just drained. Different parts of the day makes me think of there's an anti or reducing aging, anti reversing aging person, Brian Johnson, and it mentioned that we are at different at different parts of the day. Do you think it's a good idea to plan for ourselves as different people at different parts of the day so that eight o'clock John in the morning has a lot of energy and maps out? Okay, 1 p.m. John is going to be a little bit more tired, and so I will do these three or four things like ahead of the, the curve. Yeah, abs absolutely. There, there are individual differences for, for when your peak attention is. Um, it depends on a person's chronotype. It depends on what, what you're doing. You know, are you doing hard work? Do you have a lot of demands, or are you doing very easy work? But it's very important to be aware of what your personal attentional rhythm is. Um, for me, I don't, I'm, I'm not a morning person. I, I'm not a late person. I have a moderate chronotype. But I, I can't, you know, open my laptop and go right to work at the very beginning. I have to do easy work to kind of ramp myself up. That's, that's what works for me. Um, it's sort of to, to get the wheels moving. And then once I, you know, have my, the wheels of my mind are starting to move, then, you know, I can really jump in and do really hard work. Um, and then it's really important to take breaks. And as soon as you start feeling that you're getting exhausted, it's so important to step back and get replenished so that we, we don't get ourselves exhausted. Then you, you can't do very much when you are. You know, the, the same way that you warm up into item, kind of like you described in the book, a uh, reverse U-shape is what I do at the gym. I spend way too long on the treadmill warming up and slower items, maybe an hour before I really do the active work versus somebody I know will just go straight to a lot of physical activity. 
And I do that in other categories as well. I find it very valuable. The warm up, which means that peak time is highly valuable and must be protected, I would say. And then also to the point of, uh, you mentioned in the book, not letting your resources get diminished. Is it sort of like almost a, like a phone battery where if it's in the 20 to 80% range, the battery lasts much longer, but if you let it drop to below 20, it will actually damage the battery over time if you keep it too low, same as us. I, I, I'm not sure we, I, I don't think we damage the mind um, if we keep our batteries too low. Um, what we do risk is being stressed and we, we risk burnout and, and that's, uh, you know, burnout can certainly have long lasting effects. Uh, it, I, I, no, we, we don't, we don't permanently damage the mind, but we do risk putting ourselves, um, at, at stress. And then, you know, if you really have serious stress, then it's, it's hard to function. That's a valid point. Now, one thing I did like quite a bit, uh, there was mentioned a few times as far as stress is testing of immunoglobulin A reactivity as a marker of stress, part of a uh, stress scale. And is it worth a person understanding their stress points and reducing it to a um, level where they are not having significantly higher mental workload, frustration, those kinds of things? Is it can the average person start to piece together the parts of their day that are over, they're overextending themselves? Yes, it, it, it definitely is worth understanding uh, your, your stress level. It's understanding, it's, it's worth understanding things that get you stressed so that you can work out coping strategies or if, if you can avoid doing them. But it's extremely important to be aware of your level of stress. Um, it's it's easy to to miss that. You know, I used to work just straight through. You know, I'd work through the evenings. You know, I, I had a pretty I still do have a demanding job as a professor, uh, and I would just you know kind of push myself to the bone, getting, getting papers out and work done. And I wasn't really so aware of my stress level. Now I'm, I'm much more aware. And I, I know when I start feeling mentally exhausted, I know to pull back, give myself a break, replenish my resources, because I, I can perform better, much better if, if I do that. We want to stay in that great state that we are built for. Mm -hmm. There were quite a few items in the book that reminded me of related material. One was uh, G GTD, Getting Things Done by David Allen, where you write out all your tasks or your email and you clear it out. And you had mentioned the idea of even if you write out the unfinished items, that makes you more at peace than even the finished ones because those are a closed loop. And the unfinished is like an open loop that's always pinging on the brain. What is the value of that? Should someone write out all their unfinished items daily, regularly, weekly? Um, the, the best time to do that is before you go to sleep. And um, there, there is a psychological um, effect. It's known as the Zygarnik effect. It was discovered by Bluma Zygarnik about a hundred years ago. She worked at University of Berlin. She discovered that when people had tasks that were unfinished, they remembered them better than tasks that were finished. Why? Because when tasks are unfinished, it creates a tension, right? We have this tension um, she even called it a need that we, we need to finish these. Right, we we and and it's a a human basic human drive to reduce tension, and that comes from uh, my favorite psychologist Kurt Lewin, who talks about you know all humans. That's our central need to reduce tension, not not just tension in terms of stress, but tension means to come to a resolution about something. 
and an unfinished task is, is one example of that. So uh, going back to, should we write these down? Uh, if you write it down before you go to bed, you're, you're transferring all that tension and that, you know, that unfinished, the unfinished task onto an external memory. And that external memory is a piece of paper or it's your phone. And once it's on that, think of it as that, you know, it's, it's your hard drive, whether it's paper or wherever you happen to record it. Once it's stored there, then you're removing it from your mind. And as a result, you have less tension. And studies show it's easier for people to fall asleep when they do it. Now, what's interesting is that when people write down finished tasks, at the end of the day, it, it didn't have the same effect. Why? Because when something is already finished, it's off your plate and it's out of your mind. And so it made no difference to write it down. So uh, get it, you know, putting unfinished tasks onto some kind of external memory is, is a really good idea. I thought of something good. I don't know how I didn't think of it before, but is it fair to say that items that cause tension take up our attention? Yes, uh, sure. But there's a lot of things that take up our attention. Um, you know, even very positive things, exciting things take up our, our attention. So, um, you know, items that cause tension, that's just one aspect, one kind of thing that, that take up our attention. I like that they were directly connected there. Now, in what would you say at the current time is the biggest issue that the average person has in their day that is limiting them with regards to their own ability to do things or productivity based on these items? So what, what is the thing that limits people the most? Mm -hmm. Right now in relation to attention or lack of attention or attention being control. Yeah. Um... I mean, I, I think there's a lot of things. I, I don't think there's any single thing. So, um, I mean, what, one of the things is what we talked about earlier, you know, people are in a reactive mode and we have to switch to get into a proactive mode. When, when you're in a reactive mode, um, you're simply just reacting to the demands of the environment and you're not, exhibiting agency where, where you have control. And so I think, you know, it's really important for people to be able to exert control, um, to, uh, to use their free will, so to speak, over what, what they want to accomplish, what, what they want to do, uh, not just in using their devices, but in anything that, that they do throughout the day. Um, that's, that's the real key. Does building our agency or using it each time, does it build on itself such that if we do it once and then 20 minutes later, we do something else that we feel like we were in control again, and we do it three, four times in a row for a couple of hours, do we start to really build momentum? Like, okay, we are in control of things and it's harder for something to take away from our, uh, self-management. Yeah. So we, of course, we, we can, um, it's a skill that can be developed. And the, the more you exert agency, the better you understand how to do it. And the more we do it, the easier it gets. So uh, absolutely, it's, uh, it's a skill. Um, an example is uh, in the book, I talk about this idea of meta-awareness. And meta-awareness means bringing um, the, all the unconscious actions that we do, bringing them to a conscious awareness. So an unconscious action is grabbing for my phone or clicking uh, to check news, to read news, uh, checking social media, that's an unconscious action. But if I probe myself, which means I, I pause and I ask myself, and I, you know, I query myself, do I really need to check news right now? Or why, why am I grabbing my phone? And I might discover, oh, it's 
because what I'm doing is bored, because I'm procrastinating, I don't feel like doing what I'm doing. I identify the reason, and then it's a lot easier to take action and be intentional. And a lot of times when we're uh, you know, just grabbing our phone and we ask ourselves, why, why am I doing this? There, there may not be a good reason. It's a habit, right? It's just not in our conscious awareness. And so that can help us stop these kinds of automatic behaviors and, you know, help us be more intentional in what we do. And meta-awareness is a skill. It's about observing your behavior. It's, It's observing and reflecting on your behavior and understanding why you do what you do. And the more you do it, the more it becomes second nature. And so now when I have an urge, say, to check news, you know, I'll stop myself and say, wait a minute, do I I need to do that right now? Usually not. Sometimes if I really need a break, I'll say, okay, I'm going to go and read news for a bit. And then when I'm there, I ask myself, am I still getting value out of this? And, you know, do I find value in what I'm reading? Chances are no. And then I go back to work or go back to whatever the task was I was doing. If a person is in a strong mental state and has good awareness, is there still good methods for what to put on their home screen of their phone or their desktop uh, icons as far as uh, what they showcase themselves, does it matter if they are doing well or even if they are doing well or poorly, does the home screen or the things we see most quickly have an impact on how much attention control we maintain or the tasks we want to go toward? Well, sure, of course, because the um, the home screen, is it's a portal to, to the internet. And so, you know, you want to turn off notifications, um, You know, if you have a lot of browser tabs on your uh, computer, you know, they can be tempting. Um, You know, if if you are going to keep browser tabs open, um, be be strategic over what these tabs are. Are they they for things that you go to because of work, you know, or are they rather things that could potentially distract you? So, you know, it's it's a good idea to do some house cleaning and check out the um, check out your your portal, which is your your interface and and see what you have on it that could potentially distract you. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned earlier that a state of high focus, which we can find to be valuable, is quite draining. Is there a best practices for like having two heavy focus periods, one in the morning, one in the evening, or just one a day? Or is there anything about that that can be efficient as far as the heavy focus time? Mm-hmm. So, you know, there there are individual differences. Most people tend to have two periods of time of peak focus. Um, and it, I think it's very really important for an individual to become aware of what their own personal rhythm is, you know, chances are you will have a peak sometime in the morning. For some people, if you're an early type, early chronotype, your peak might be quite early in the morning. Uh, But then it's time to make sure to take a really significant break. And you could do that by switching to road activity, which is activity that's not challenging. you, you know, take a, a very good lunch break, really take a lunch break. Don't just sit in front of your computer and, and do email, uh, which I, I used to do quite a bit. Uh, and then chances are people will have another period of peak, peak focus uh, in the afternoon. I, I highly value those periods but I, because I think most of the good things in our existence come from just those brief periods. And if I have to, or some of us have to warm up to them, then there's extended periods around them. So those brief minutes are, 
I think of them like 10 times as much as other minutes because so much gets done at those certain points. They have to be like guarded like a like in a, a safe or a cellar or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's a fair point. One thing that came to mind, you mentioned, uh, Herd Lewin, uh, who are some people who have had the most impact on your understanding of attention other than him? Oh, well, there's William James, who's known as the father of psychology. And uh, William James has a very famous quote. He says, everyone knows what attention is. <laughs> In other words, you, you know it when you see it. Um, but he was just talking about controlled attention. He wasn't talking about attention where, you know, we're drawn to do things automatically. Uh, Kurt Lewin, who he mentioned, who talked about the idea of humans' basic, um, most basic drive is for attention reduction. Uh, another person whose work I value very much is Walter Michel, whose, whose work actually um, dealt with personality and, um, and also uh, self-regulation. So, you know, he's, many people know of him as the person who did the marshmallow test, which was a, a looking at self-regulation of very young kids. And he found that behavior at a very young age is predictive of a number of things uh, years, years on. Uh, and uh, Walter Michel also is, you know, a real pioneer in the area of personality. And he's, he's actually the one who found out that uh, personality changes depending on context. We, we have a basic underlying personality system, but it's modified by, by the context we're in. Um, I'm also very influenced by Albert Bandura, uh, social psychologist. He passed away uh, not too long ago, and he was very concerned with self-efficacy and how people can really learn to um, develop agency to have control over behaviors. His, he looked at work, um, how people can stop smoking, how they can control substance abuse. Uh, so he he did some some really important work there. Uh, so there are you know many other people. Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman, uh, talked about the idea of attentional resources. Um, many many others have talked about that idea as well. Very important individual, Daniel Kahneman, along with the others. Now, actually, it made me think of the current landscape. How would you look at it since the last, let's say, decade? Social media has become super skilled at grabbing who knows how many people's attention for how long. And that has gone to a crescendo point. And now the last couple of years, there's a turnaround like uh, we don't want our attention to all be absorbed by algorithms and whatnot. What does the next... Uh, a few years look like does it look like some sort of the the social media that does well is the kind that does not grab so much of your attention or it's boxed somehow is there any shift in the next few years so it's it's hard to predict what's going to happen you know as we know even in the last few months with twitter there you know so many things have happened that you know it's uh you know, it's it's hard to predict what the future may hold. Um, I don't think, be, because of the profit motive, um, targeted advertising, targeted algorithms to grab our attention uh, for notifications like social media notifications or to grab our attention for social media feeds, these are not going to go away. I really don't think so because they're tied to the bottom line for companies. And of course, companies want, they want eyeballs on their um, platforms so that their advertising revenue can increase. So that's, that's not gonna go away. What I think is gonna happen is that um, there will be tech solutions. And I know, I know it's ironic, but I think there will be tech solutions that can help people gain agency. 
for example, I, I do think that AI can will be developed that can help people um, as a coach to help coach people to help them better recognize their behaviors. You know, I talked about how important it is for us to recognize automatic behaviors. You know, and it you know wouldn't it be nice to have a friend sitting with you and saying, hey, hey Gloria, I see you're you know going to social media. Why don't you put a halt on it? Or why don't you figure out why you're going to social media? And I could see that AI understanding our behaviors and you know, saying, for example, Gloria, you're you're pretty drained. Your attentional resources are are low. And of course, we know when attentional resources resources are low, we're more susceptible to distractions. We, we know that we're more susceptible even for distractions within ourselves, not even that come externally through notifications. So I could see an AI smart assistant coaching us, not doing the work for us. We are in control, but giving us the information we need so that we can make decisions. It could be like a person on the side saying, are you sure you want to open that application right now? This is the thing you might want to put your time to. It may be time to go take a walk. Yeah, for example, you know, I, I could say, you know, I can imagine, Gloria, that if you take a walk, you know, take a 15 minute walk right now and you're going to perform so much better in the afternoon. It's like a super coach that is a counter force in tech to the other tech. It's the next, uh, it's like the next step. Yeah. The first step didn't have this part. The first step was just how much can be grabbed. And then a follow-up step that can only go on for so long before everybody is the, uh, energized and a bit stressed and a lot of compare comparison has happened. And then you notice after a few years, wait a minute, this is not functional for my being as a person or where I'm going towards. Mm -hmm. uh, we see the pendulum swing every, every few years. What would you say are some of the uh, any exciting elements in the attention space? Any uh, research that is intriguing right now or uh, things we have not looked at, let's say 10 years ago that we are looking at now? Well, there's there's a lot of uh, really fascinating work in neuroscience, but um, there is there still needs to be a lot more work because you know some of the results are not so robust, but I, I see a lot of exciting work uh, coming out in neuroscience. For example, what regions of the brain might be activated for different kinds of thoughts and uh, different kinds of stimuli. And I, and I do see, again, what I talked about having smart assistants uh, come into play will be very exciting for attention. Um, I did some work with uh, Eve Kamani, who did was the lead researcher. Uh, this was at Microsoft Research, and she developed a smart assistant uh, that was called Amber. And Amber um, basically gave people suggestions. You know, when it's time to take a break. It nudged people if they were on social media too long. And so there were very promising results that this kind of software agent could, could really help people. And people, of course, can control the agent. The agent is not controlling them. They have control over the agent. They, they can adjust the agent. They don't have to obey the agent. You know, they can ignore it but it gives people suggestions. And, um, you know, people, we, we did a, a user study and people found this to be very valuable. Wonderful assistant to have there. Now I have, well, that's kind of cool. I have two last items to bring up. One is on the back of your book, you have Cal Newport that I have found him to be highly informative and valuable as far as deep work and digital minimalism and the theme that he's presenting uh, is, is the landscape much more set up 
for those who have full agency and control of their being? Are they the majority that we are hearing from in public discourse because the other individuals don't have the wherewithal or uh, self agency to get things going in a way? Is it like a separation? So, uh, you know, I'd, I wouldn't say it. there. there's not like two separate groups. It's more of a continuum. But, you know, certainly there, there are people who have excellent self-regulation skills. Um, we've seen that in our research, and there's people who aren't, and it's a personality trait. Um, but just because you're not born with good self-regulation skills doesn't mean that you can't develop them. You can. You, you can uh, learn how to self-regulate. For example, uh, this notion I talked about practicing meta-awareness, be, being aware of your automatic actions and becoming more intentional. So yeah, there are some people with excellent self-regulation. I've had people, participants in my studies who say they have no trouble at all. Um, you know, focusing, they have no trouble being distracted by social media. They're, you know, able to just focus extended periods of time. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's really how extended it is because people can get exhausted. Uh, and there are others who, who do need help, who, who have problems, who do struggle. So it's, it's really a continuum. Um, I think most people can improve you know, depending where you are in the continuum, we can always do better. We can always improve our attention. But I, I want to stress that I, I would like to reframe the goal. Instead of trying to be as focused as long as possible, uh, to instead, the main goal should be, let's think about our well-being. Because um, we can't have long extended periods of focus in the same way that we, when you go to the gym, you can't lift weights for a long extended period of time. You get exhausted, right? We, we have to take breaks. And, you know, might be if you're lifting weights, you might have to wait to the next day or, you know, every, every other day before you lift weights. But it's the same with focused attention. We, we can't be, you know, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. completely focused without a break. We, we have to vary the kinds of attention we use. Sometimes we can use focused attention, sometimes rote attention, where we're engaged and, and not challenged, and, and sometimes breaks to get ourselves uh, replenished, to restore our attention. So it's really important to be aware of your own personal rhythm for, for when your attention is at its peak and, and when it's not. I was going to add in a summarization of the concepts of your book, but I think you just included in there because that's a valid point of well-being, balance, happiness, and productivity. It's not so much just about that uh, domineering focus repeatedly and the goal oriented nature, but the well being you have as a person, that's one of the elements that we can take for years versus productivity, maybe just for a certain task or set of tasks. That's a valid point. Yeah. And I, I will say when, when people have well being, they, they can do more. And, and we know this from psychological research that when people feel positive, they, they can perform better, they, they can generate more ideas and better quality ideas. They um, can, you know, can be more creative, uh, better analytical thinking. So you know, if, you, if your goal is to really focus on well-being, you will be productive. You'll be productive along the way and will do better quality work. Very important and I take this one into account Without well-being, we can't get to the other parts because that's first, which is a good homage to some uh, generational differences right now is from some who are not uh, as much uh, being the younger generation, maybe from the older, their well-being not being included as much or the older it was not thought of as much 
that well-being mattered, but it does, and the other items are more temporary than your personal nature as you progress through time. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful message. We take that into account. Professor Gloria Mark, I would like to thank you for having joined on this episode of the show, discussing a bit from your wonderful book, providing messages on attention and also a good focus on our well-being as people, because that is the picture, and informing us about some of the other individuals in the space. Thank you for having me. Very glad to. And we are out.